due to this intelligence, reinforcements were dispatched from Britain to bolster the meager forces in Egypt. Throughout the Desert War, most of the battles fought between the armies of the British Empire and the Axis powers were along the narrow, fertile border of the Mediterranean Sea. With a distance of 1,000 miles between Tripoli and Alexandria, the lines of communication of all the combatants increased dramatically the further they advanced. The supply lines were stretched thin and made ideal targets for fast-moving raiders. The interior comprised vast sand seas that were virtually uninhabited and believed by most to be impassable to motor vehicles. But this desolate arena of sand dunes, rock plains, and deadly quagmire became the playground of the long-range desert group. In an area the size of the Indian subcontinent, the crews devised ingenious methods to keep their vehicles mobile in all manner of terrain, from glutinous mud to sand dunes hundreds of feet high. On September 17, 1940, the Italian army began its lumbering offensive towards Egypt. But after just four days, and advancing only 60 miles, the Italian offensive ground to a halt, and they began to construct a series of fortified positions. Finally, General Wavell's long-awaited reinforcements arrived. They had traveled around the African continent by sea to reach Egypt. Wavell and his army commanders decided to mount their own offensive against the Italians. On December 9th, the attack began. The Matilda tanks of the 7th Royal Tank Regiment led the assault. Within days, the Italians were in full retreat. Such great numbers of them were taken prisoner that it looked as if long-range desert patrols would soon not be necessary at all. During the new year, the Italian army was forced all the way back deep into Tripolitania. They were close to defeat when the German army, under the command of General Erwin Rommel, came to their rescue. Rommel quickly reorganized the Axis forces, and when several British tank formations were redeployed from Egypt to Greece, he was ready to attack. Now the British army was forced to retreat. The long-range patrols would be needed now, more than ever before. April 1941, Rommel's first offensive drives the British back more than 700 miles towards Egypt. The long-range desert patrols resume their reconnaissance missions. Originally divided into three patrols designated R, T and W, the unit is renamed the Long Range Desert Group in December 1940. The LRDG doubles in size over a period of several months with the formation of G Patrol, followed by S and Y Patrols. G Patrol was made up of men from the Brigade of Guards, S Patrol with troops from Southern Rhodesia and South Africa, and Y Patrol with personnel from British Yeomanry Regiments. All the patrols were supported by trucks carrying spare parts, fuel, and ammunition. 
the patrols had to be able to repair their vehicles in the field. They were a tough group of men. One of them, Bluey Grimsey, was stung three times by a scorpion. Grimsey survived, though the scorpion died. However, Grimsey immortalized the scorpion in the official LRDG badge, which he designed himself. The long-range desert group operated from secret bases deep behind enemy lines, with its main headquarters at Kufra in Libya. The primary aim of the LRDG was gathering information, but it also raided Italian positions. The LRDG targeted airfields and fuel dumps, often hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. They attacked isolated Italian garrisons and vehicle convoys. The Italians responded by reinforcing them with troops withdrawn from frontline units. The Desert Raiders were an aggravation to the Italian High Command, whose troops were under constant fear of attack. While these hit-and-run raids were successful, they distracted the LRDG from its primary purpose of reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. In August 1941, Major Guy Prendergast took Bagnold's place as commander of the LRDG. Meanwhile, another arm of Britain's Desert Raiders was being established. An officer of the Scots Guards named David Sterling was recovering from a parachute injury in a Cairo hospital when he came up with an idea to create a raiding force to attack strategic enemy targets, such as airfields and supply dumps. He took his proposal to General Sir Claude Auchinleck, the commander-in-chief in the Middle East, who gave the go-ahead. Sterling immediately recruited the best men for his raiding force. Most came from a recently disbanded commando unit known as Lay Force. One of the first recruits, Lieutenant Jock Lewis of the Welsh Guards, suggested creating a raiding force of commando paratroopers. Sterling adapted the concept to his plan to establish an even more dynamic force. Both men were outstanding leaders and complemented each other perfectly. While Sterling was an expert operational planner brimming with bright ideas, Lewis was a brilliant organizer and training officer. The new force was called L Detachment Special Air Service Brigade. The name suggested a substantial airborne unit and a far larger group than the 65 men whom Sterling was authorized to recruit. While Sterling scoured the Middle East Command for men and equipment, Lewis began organizing the first recruits at Cabrit on the Suez Canal. At first, L Detachment was not provided with any camp or training facilities, so Sterling and his men simply took over a camp from a New Zealand unit which was dispatched to the front line. It was the SAS's first successful raid. 